my name is Vernon Burton. I grew up in the, in the country near a small uh, rural town that had a cotton mill. And that's where I grew up. I spent most of my career at the University of Illinois. I had two stints in the Army. Hello, and welcome to Obehe Podcast. I'm your host, Obehe Ewanfo. And I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now let's get started with this episode. Uh, but I went, after I did my PhD at Princeton University, I taught for 34 years at the University of Illinois, and I taught uh, the American South and race relations uh, at the University of Illinois, and I wrote a book, The Age of Lincoln, which was very popular there, and I retired and went where I'd always wanted to teach, the American South, so I now teach at Clemson University, but I discovered that as opposed to the University of Illinois, who loved Lincoln, that people in South Carolina uh, were not as favorable to Lincoln. In fact, the culture wars have had a horrible effect on how people view history and how they relate to one another. So that's one of the things that I have been trying to do, such I did a, a big conference at Clemson. The book is coming out pretty soon. Uh, I think, in fact, in May, uh, called Lincoln's Unfinished Work, which comes from his two greatest speeches, both the Gettysburg Address and then the second inaugural. And I take that literally that he is saying that we need to continue to work to make democracy uh, work and become sort of the, uh, well, I like to say that Lincoln, who said that he would be known for anything, would be for the Emancipation Proclamation, the most important thing he did. But I think even more important was that he took what was basically our mission statement, that is the Declaration of Independence, and put it into our rule book, the Constitution, which leads me into the most recent book I've done, which is Justice Deferred, Race and the Supreme Court, uh, which I'm very proud of. Uh, one of the few good things that came out of COVID was that I was isolated and finished this book with a longtime friend, uh, one of the greatest civil rights lawyers of the modern era, Armand Durfner. We started working together in 1980 in court cases for minority plaintiffs, uh, mostly in the South, but it quickly expanded to you know Texas and California and other places. And it all came about, as they say, is the, the famous ball pair philosophy Yogi Berra said it's almost deja vu all over again, because in 1980, the Supreme Court ruled that it didn't matter that laws disadvantage minorities. In this case, it was a court case called Mobile versus Alabama, that just because the laws kept African-Americans who were a significant portion of the population from being able to elect a candidate of their choice, unless, according to the Supreme Court, unless the intention of those laws, the purpose of those laws, not the effect, but the purpose of the policymakers had been to disfranchise and keep African Americans from having an equal opportunity to elect them, that it didn't matter. So attorneys, civil rights attorneys knew that historians understood how to study and prove intent and purpose. And I remember newspapers like the New York Times and WAG saying like, well, what are we going to do? Dig up those policymakers, the legislators from 1911 in their graves and ask them, did you intend to discriminate against black people? So that's how I got involved. And that's where I met my co-author. And, you know, as in Casablanca, they say it was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And we began talking about these issues about race and the Supreme Court now for since 1980 and has finally resulted in this book justice deferred race in the supreme court thank you so much for that uh just as a kind of a prep as we are still looking at the background to sort of set the the context of the conversation this is many years now that uh, since you'll be uh, following this case uh, actually the conversation today that we are having uh, i look at it as american struggle uh, to be a fair state a state where everyone is treated equally. I want to believe that that is part of your struggle also because 
uh, later in the conversation, we're going to look at uh, uh, some of the statements that you have made and also from your book so that you can sort of clarify that for us. But just now, I would like to know from your perspective, uh, looking at the time you started um, to write about um, a, a fairer state, a fairer treatment of other people that are living, that of course make up the United States. And today, 2022, what kind of comparison would you make? Well, it's rather frightening. Uh, I did not think that we would ever be going the direction that we're going, but studying the Supreme Court and race, and really the new book looks at the history of race in America from before there was a United States until uh, we were actually covered through the Amy Comey Barrett's nomination in 2021 and even predicted a court case that has uh, bad consequences for minority scholars uh, for minority people in America as as well, but I didn't think we would we would go back the way we're going. In fact, it's rather frightening. I think that democracy itself is in a crisis that we haven't seen in the United States since the Civil War, that is the 1860s, and the similarities are so great. It, it's rather frightening. Uh, a lot of people did not understand why Lincoln thought keeping the union together was so important at that time. And uh, he's gotten into a lot of criticism because Abraham Lincoln was willing to sign a 13th amendment that said that slavery could stay where it was, it couldn't expand, but it would stay in South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, because he thought the union was so important. And the reason is Lincoln knew his history as opposed to so many of our leaders today. So the Confederacy, which was moving toward authoritarianism and a hierarchical society, was much more in line with the rest of the world than with the than the United States was. People forget that after the American Revolution, then there were revolutions in France. Republics grew up all over the world. Mexico was a republic. Democracies were were thriving as people began to think you didn't have to live in a hierarchical society. Where, where you were in your place in society was determined by where your father was. And it was sort of a rank order uh, in terms of God to the king, the monarch to dukes and all of the sort of hierarchy so that everyday people just had to accept where they were. But what we forget is like the musical that I love, Les Miserables, that Napoleon restored the monarchy. Uh, in France and the rest of the world was moving that way. Napoleon III put Maximilian on the throne in Mexico, which had been a democracy. Uh, Garibaldi, the hero of two continents who had fought in Latin America for democracy comes back and he reunites where you are now, Italy, and he thought it would be a democracy. Instead, they opted for a monarchy. So that is why Lincoln was so determined to make democracy work in the United States. And where do we find ourselves today? Looking at the same situation, authoritarianism, um, regimes, hierarchical regimes growing throughout the world and even in the United States, people calling for this sort of authoritarianism. And Lincoln's answer was that because when he said the United States is the last best hope in the world, he really meant it. So what he believed in was on one hand, you're gonna have total sort of authoritarian regimes or countries. And if you didn't have law or some sense of order, then you'd have anarchy. So his answer was the constitution and the rule of law. And that's why I like to say how important he was that with the 13th, 14th and 15th amendment, he took that declaration of independence that says all men are created equal. And now we can say in a larger sense, all people are created equal and put it into the Constitution itself, our rule book. So I am concerned at where we are. And it's so different as you study history that before the Supreme Court was in touch with the people, they made terrible rulings like Dred Scott and other things. These rulings were horrible, Jim Crow said. But that's where the country sort of was. That's not true now, I think. Most people in the United States want to see democracy work, do not want to see discrimination. Uh, just look how quickly 
attitudes changed in the last decade toward people who are gay or lesbian and those sort of rights that have come about. And young people in particular are really, I think, don't want to be discriminating against other people. Nobody actually wants to be discriminated against looking at, no. at the negative effect it has on the people. And, and I, I want to really uh, stick on a little bit to uh, what you were saying or referring to Lincoln, that all men are created equal. I think that one will, to some people, they will mean, like George Joe will say in his book, The Animal Farm, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than the other. That is how we, it appeared to most that that is the law in the United States. Could you make a clarification on that, uh, if that is how you see it too, that all people are equal in the United States, but some are more equal than the other, which is against what Liko was saying? Yeah, well, I think the laws are, are and how they're interpreted, and that's where the problem has been. You cannot make people not like other people. I don't understand it. I've never met anybody I didn't like. There are people who don't like me, and I can understand that, but, but I don't. But prejudice, uh, in this day and age, people should understand. Let's take the issue, as I try to explain in the new book, Justice Deferred. There's no such thing as race. You know, whether you take it as a person of faith like myself, that all people are created in God's image, or if you look at science, there's no such thing as race. We're all the, the same. But in the United States and other places, and particularly the Supreme Court was part of this, they took that concept, a social construct, not a reality, and made something called race and treated different people according to the Constitution and the laws differently based on that concept of race. And up until one of the arguments in our book is that we have had 12 generations, if you think of a generation as 25 years, of the courts and the law teaching white supremacy, teaching uh, and, and actually requiring white people to discriminate against black people and thinking that's the normal. And only like two generations, uh, really since the 1950s, a little bit of starting in the 1930s maybe, but really from the 1950s till about the 1970s or 80s, did the courts begin to, and the laws start ruling that people had to be treated the same. Um, but I still hope that history is a powerful tool. It was one that Lincoln came to understand and learn that history with evidence, despite all the notions of alternative facts, there is such a thing as evidence. Uh, I love when John Adams, the, the second president said, you, there are facts, you have to deal with them. And if we understand the evidence, then we can do something to move forward. But I'm worried about the courts today. In the United States, we don't have a parliamentarian form of government. It's a winner take all for the presidency. They appoint federal judges and the Supreme Court for lifetime, for a lifetime appointment. And the, the last few years in particular, with just how extraordinarily partisanship has played into this and the use of race, using race and old tactics that were used in the, in the 1890s to sort of motivate people to vote against their own economic interest by using basically what would have been thought of as racist or at least appeals of racism um, have, have come way too common in the United States. And one political party has sort of embraced uh, using uh, this technique, very similar to the 1890s. I'm doing a court case at this time um, as an expert witness in Georgia against a law called uh, SB 202. And I was asked to investigate the difference between now and 1982 when they renewed the Voting Rights Act for 25 years because Judge Alito ruled and said, today is not like 1982. And he's right. Unfortunately, it in some ways it is worse. Everybody in 1982 thought people had the right to vote. But now we are having the Supreme Court rule in favor of laws that keep people from voting. 
are trying to. It's like going back to 1898 in the famous court case that set all this off, Williams versus Mississippi, which basically said if you can use neutral language and not say we're trying to keep people who are Latinx or African American from voting, but we are going to require people to have an in-person voter ID when the majority of the people who do not have them are black people or don't have driver's license, things like that. So this is <laughs> one of my one of my great concerns. And and people know this, but they find ways to do it. And one of the big changes that's happened in America is when I did the for the NACP LDF, the in-person voter ID in Texas, I, I can give you a, a great example of that. Uh, the Supreme Court had just, well, the federal courts had just said that this Texas voter ID law was discriminatory and denied it. But then Judge Roberts ruled in uh, Shelby County versus Holder that Section 5, which is where the Justice Department comes in, has to approve these laws, was no longer constitutional. And Texas, within almost minutes, reinstated the law. Well, I was an expert, and I had been there in 2003 or four when there was a midterm redistricting by Congressman uh, DeLay of Texas, where he thought he could get two more Republican seats. And the reason he thought he could do it because there had been a huge increase in population in Texas, which most of it had been uh, Hispanic or Latinx. And uh, when I was there, the judge said to me while I was on the stand, Professor Burton, how can we have democracy when young people don't vote? How can we get young people to vote? The next time I'm on the stand testifying in Texas, I said to the judges, now the last time I was here, I was asked, why can't we get people to vote? And yet I am here now, and the state of Texas is trying to stop people from voting. And then I told them why. One of the things that's happened is Texas has become a majority minority population. That white people are a minority in that state and the United States is moving that way. That's a huge change. And of course you have a recession and every time you have bad economic times, it, it, it has never been good for race relations, unfortunately. And then thirdly, when President Obama ran for president, and I was surprised that he won, but it was the first time that particularly African-Americans and other minorities saw a candidate that they could identify with. So they registered at a higher rate than ever before and voted at a higher rate. And I think that really, really scared a lot of white people and particularly the Republican party, unfortunately, the great party of Lincoln is the party that has used that fear to get people to support their candidates. And it really took off in 2016 in an extraordinarily bad way, I think. And I just hope that we can do something about it because the courts, because of that, uh, those election processes and that um, a president appoints a Supreme Court justice, federal justice for life, then when President Donald Trump won in 2016, he appointed three justices, three for a lifetime, all, at least they seem to be, and I have some hope that maybe they will change as they look at the evidence and the law, very ruling against that very laws that are supposed to guarantee equality, like the Voting Rights Act. All right, talking about the voting right, I have a, a question for you. I was uh, uh, going through uh, your statement during this, uh, the reconstruction symposium. I think that was 2020, 2021. Uh, you did make a statement, uh, a kind of a reference, saying at a time that they will allow African America to vote, but they will simply not count the vote. Can you please expatiate on that? What does it mean? Well, yes. Uh, well, there are two things. I mean, there were times when they just didn't count the votes or threw them away. But what's happening now is they're finding ways to dilute that vote so that they don't have the impact that would make a difference in a, an election. That is with gerrymandering, with slicing and dicing districts, uh, it's become outrageous. Um, 
in, in how our election system works. As you know, we have an electoral college, so it doesn't matter that Hillary Clinton had uh, millions more votes than Donald Trump, but because of the electoral college, Donald Trump won the election. Um, so, and how that works is the carving up of congressional districts, uh, and it's almost like slicing and dicing, almost surgically moving people into uh, one area. Of course, gerrymandering goes way back, uh, well before race became part of it, but it has been the way, particularly after the Civil War, uh, that race uh, became an issue, particularly in the former Confederacy. Uh, you could sort of try to draw these strange districts, pack all African Americans in one district in North Carolina, or South Carolina, and that would be the only place they could elect someone, say, for Congress. And then they went into the laws like we're going into now in the 1890s and 1898 that basically disfranchised African Americans by having a white primary, by having a literacy laws and all these. And we're unfortunately it's so frightening, we're going right back to it. In fact, you know, I've said that that the Civil War, the similarities are so, so extraordinary right now, it just calls out that everybody sort of focuses on the Civil War as the maybe where American identity can be found. And part of that reason is, of course, the horribleness of war, how many people were killed, the more people killed in that war, Americans and, and almost any, but also it dealt with the very issues we are dealing with now, I think, and that is, what is it, what is the place of other people besides white people in our society and our culture and a democracy, what we might think of as multiculturalism now. And we're struggling again with those same issues, even though I thought that had all been solved, particularly since 1980 with the Voting Rights Act, which is so important. You shouldn't need a Voting Rights Act of 1965 because we had the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments, and that's a part of the Constitution. But one of the historical patterns you see is the continual use of race as a way to disfranchise and keep the influence as voters of a group of people. You said before that the race, which of course I agree with you 100%, that is, is just a construction you know, that is nothing scientific that we can actually attribute to it you know? because uh, most often time when people talk about uh, what is happening in the United States they, they think that is where it started that is where it ends but I often say no if we are looking at the relationship between African and European and by extension the African American and the European American who want to call themselves the real American we need to look beyond that that for thousands of years these two people have been have been interacting for for very many years so we must we must be able to look beyond that and understand where we are coming from the way the way the society is civil set up the african american are just set up to be disenfranchised this the the way they occupy this this the session of the cities where they live where they are predominant development is low in education is low in even in every way there is like a chain literally on their neck, on their leg, on their hands. So the question for you is, what is really fully the discrimination against African America? Is it the law, the constitution, or the people? Well, I think how people have interpreted and used the law. For instance, you know, a lot of white people have uh, fought affirmative action. Uh, but what they don't understand is how people got into those economic areas where their houses didn't improve and everything. There was affirmative action for white people that deliberately excluded black people, particularly because at that time of the New Deal, still most African-Americans lived in the former Confederacy. Most of them were agricultural laborers or domestic. So when the New Deal put in all these policies to help people like Social Security, the Southern congressman got the, they didn't say we're gonna exclude black people, but they said, okay, that doesn't apply to domestic workers. That does not apply to farm labor. So they got, so whereas whites got so secure, but it gets even more. Look at the GI Bill. The GI Bill allowed 
all these soldiers from World War II to go to college and to then with that be able to buy homes and places. And those homes really were bought in places that were that appreciated. So they had all of the sort of capital of that. Then they have that to be able to send their children to school. Black veterans, black fought in every war, black people. Uh, the Civil War, Lincoln argued, probably couldn't have been won without black soldiers. And even you can go further back than that. Well, World War II veterans could go to a college, right? But in the American South, there were only historically black colleges. The school that I teach at, Clemson University or the University of Indiana, they were all segregated. They Black people only under court order was Clemson was the first place to integrate in South Carolina in 63 and only because Judge Perry and Harvey Gantt sued them and made them do it. Uh, so they had to go. Now, I love historical black colleges. One of my heroes is Dr. Benjamin Mays, a longtime sort of president of Morehouse College, was sort of the spiritual mentor of the civil rights movement, convinced Dr. King that he could be a minister and not an attorney and still do good things for his people. Uh, I mean, so Morehouse, I love history, but they didn't have the resources or the connections that the white schools did that people could network afterwards. And when in fact, African-Americans did use their GI loans to buy a house, they had restricted covenant. These are state sponsored covenants called redlining that meant they could not, in fact, buy in the areas a home that would appreciate. It kept them out. There were covenants and other things. So their homes did not appreciate. You see how this keeps going on and on. Medical schools were segregated. There were only really two where African-Americans could go and they were not, you know, they were good schools, but not the top one. So all of this was structurally built by affirmative action for white people and black people were excluded by the law and by the way the law was interpreted. And you see how that builds generation after generation. People say, oh, well, slavery was over a long time ago, but it wasn't in terms of how people were treated and discriminatory laws that is the accumulation of wealth. And that's the big difference in America. You know, the, the um, uh, salary, the comparative salaries have, have come close together now, but not the accumulated wealth that is the basis of what families and happens to family and the children of people that allow people to move up in society. What Lincoln believed in so much, having been born poor himself, that you should get rewarded according to your abilities. Does that make sense to you? What I'm saying, and Absolutely. I outline that in the book. I outline that in the book because most people are totally unaware of it. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing, the other thing it, we haven't talked about is the violence and the kind of things that African Americans have faced every day. Most people think terrorism in the United States didn't occur at a 9-11. Well, African-Americans have lived in a terroristic society in the United States, at least until 1965 in the Voting Rights Act. I mean, when Dr. King went into jail, uh, people don't understand why people were, how many people had gone into jail for protesting segregation and under, never heard for from again. Uh, and people got away with it. This Ahmaud Aubrey case, are you familiar with that in Georgia? Uh, that would have, those three men who killed Ahmaud Aubrey, the jogger in Georgia, who were convicted, would never even gone to trial because unless a reporter had been pursuing it, the, the, the uh, law officials and the district attorney, all of those that enjoyed, had said it, it was okay, it was justified. And so, um, the George Floyd incident, until people started videotaping, these things happened all the time, but people didn't believe it. It was like the civil rights movement. I've often said the reason you explain the civil rights movement in, is often called the second reconstruction versus the first reconstruction after the civil war, which is I think the most progressive period the United States and certainly the former Confederacy's ever had and has not been understood and I think there is where you need to look if you're looking for the identity of America. That's where we hammered out who we would be as a nation. 
So, and it was overthrown. It was literally overthrown. I mean, January the 6th reminds you of this, that an interracial government, in that case, Republicans, black and white, who were legitimately elected, were overthrown in coup d'etats in the United States in 1870s. And um, we sort of ignore that. And we created this mythology that's just not true. Uh, it was an extraordinary time of, of progressive government in the Confederacy. So uh, it's very important what historians write and looking at the evidence and not just what people tell you happened, but what is really going on. And I think that's what we have to do if we're gonna save democracy is be truth tellers and speak truth to power. Now, uh, looking at your explanation, which are actually very brilliant and interesting, uh, it is not difficult to make the conclusion that it's actually the Constitution, the law of the United States, that is encouraging the discrimination against a section of this of, of its own citizen. You know? And if that is the case, how can these people find justice if the law itself uh, is sort of structured in a way that they can be victimized? Where can they find justice? Well, there are three branches of government. We often forget that. The executive, Congress, and, of course, the Supreme Court. And I think that's what's in 1980, as I told about how I got involved as an expert witness for minority plaintiffs to get the vote and their rights as citizens, Congress stepped up in a bipartisan way and renewed the Voting Rights Act in 1982 and actually said, you don't have to show intent. The, the effect of the laws are enough. That's when I said, it's like deja vu all over again, as Yogi Berra said, because the same thing is going on in the court now. People have to be able to vote. That's why it's so important they're trying to keep people from voting. That is the way it is, but the law is the law. And there is such a thing as evidence, and I have seen it, that when you show the evidence to the judges, then they have to rule according to the law. Now, I think that's what we have to do. People have to vote. The harder they make it to vote, the more you've got to be willing to go out to vote. Stacey Abrams has done an amazing job in Georgia of getting people out to vote. She probably won that Georgia governor's election, but Brian Kemp had, as Secretary of State, disfranchised. In fact, some people say in one day in Georgia, he was able to disfranchise more people than ever been done in one day anywhere. Uh, but what she did is then organized people, got them registered and got them out to vote. And look what happened. Uh, not only did Biden win Georgia as president, but the first Jewish senator ever was elected and Reverend Warnock was elected. So two Democratic senators there. So that's what I think people have to do and not give up and keep calling on that legacy of Lincoln to finish the work for democracy. To, As I said, I really believe there are more good people than bad people. And I really believe young people want to be good people. But a lot of them don't understand what's going on. How many of them understand how affirmative action had worked for white people all those years? all those generations and had worked against and left out African-Americans. Um, so I think we have to make sure. And I mean, that's one of the reason now that politicians and states are trying to keep history from being taught the truth. Truth <laughs> is powerful. The truth is powerful. And, you know, I'm doing a workshop next week, I believe maybe the week after as I can't quite remember on what they call critical race theory, which is just silly, it's a legal thing, it's not being taught anywhere, but for, for teachers, and it's because they are afraid of the truth. I really believe people can change. You know, Abraham Lincoln was not born the great emancipator. He was, uh, you argue in the book, The Age of Lincoln, he was actually a white Southerner by birth and by culture, but he learned, I mean, that's the difference, and he changed his mind as he met African-Americans like the great Robert Smalls or Frederick Douglass, he moved so that by the end of his life, instead of uh, sort of ignoring, I mean, he was always anti-slavery, but he was never abolitionist. But by the end of his life, 
he is leading the nation to a better place on race relations. And that's why he was killed. It wasn't because of the Civil War. He's just given a speech in John Wilkes Booth here, and he starts talking about voting rights, citizenship rights. Remember in the second inaugural, it was an incredible thing he said that people didn't notice that the widows would be taken care of of the soldiers. He's talking about the black soldiers as well, that they are part of the body politics. He says the war couldn't have been won many of the battles without black soldiers. And then he starts saying there's gonna be a change and people have to be rewarded for what they've done and the vote. And John Wilkes Booth, the assassin turned to his friend. He said, that'd be the last speech he ever made. He's talking about, he uses the horrible N word, you know, citizenship, in other words, black citizenship. And he was not crazy. He knew where Lincoln was going, just like he moved toward the Emancipation Proclamation. He was moving toward citizenship and he was right. That was the last speech that Lincoln made. He killed him for that reason. So Lincoln becomes part of a long, long, long list of martyrs like Martin Luther King Jr. who were killed because they were fighting for black citizenship rights. And I think all particularly young people need to remember the struggle and the fight that so many have done that we stand on their shoulders to make the United States a place where everyone has the opportunity to go as far as they can by their ability and their willingness to work for it. Yeah, that is many dream, Oti, now. Uh, just on, at, at 2022, that is still a dream. That is, of course, a reality for only the white people in America. For the black, for the black people, it's still a dream. And we believe that that dream might come to a reality one day. All right, now let's talk a little bit about the 14th Amendment and what it might mean to the African American. Uh, what do you have to say about that kind of a background information? Yeah, let me back up just a, well, let me, the 14th Amendment is clearly written. I mean, it was the intention to give citizenship because the Dred Scott decision was still the law of the land. And so the 14th Amendment says that African Americans are citizenship, are citizens. And secondly, um, you know, other people were excluded from migration, but African Americans weren't, or people of African descent could come to the United States when they were excluding Chinese and others. Uh, so it's very important, but what happened with the 14th Amendment is in fact, if you look what the courts have done with it, 80% of the cases are for corporations because the Supreme Court ruled that corporations are covered as persons. And so it's, it's really horrible that way in the way that it's been used. And now the 14th Amendment is being used by white people to try to deny black people uh, the opportunities to go to college, claiming that it's discriminating against them, that in, any person. So I wanna back up and say though, um, the 13th Amendment is one of the themes of our book. And people forget it's, it's not just that it ended enslavement, but it was interpreted by the courts as ending the badges of slavery. So that amendment is still powerful and attorneys can use that to say that these badges of slavery are unconstitutional. And you can see those badges of slavery when you go into a fast food restaurant, white people will be at the counter um, you know, taking the bill and African-Americans, Latinx and others will be back in the kitchen cooking or busing things. That would be badges of slavery. So I have some hope that always people have been creative to fight injustice. And we've won against all odds. And look at the great Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall, against all odds, won almost every case he argued in the Supreme Court. Uh, unfortunately, when he got on the Supreme Court, he was on the losing side most of the time, but his dissents are important as well. The first picture in my book, Justice Deferred, in the introduction, is when he's getting off the train in Charleston, South Carolina, the civil media to argue what becomes Brown v. Board. It really begins in South Carolina with rural black families fighting for the rights for their children. It's the first case, in fact, which a federal judge says that separate but equal is not right and that black people are being 
discriminate against. And I, at that time, Thurgood Marshall said something so important. I put it right there in the picture. He said, sometimes I get tired of saving white people's souls. And I think that's so important that justice is also about not just what is fair for minorities and especially black people in America who had been enslaved, but what does it do to white people to teach little children that they are superior? What is it doing to them and their souls? I mean, that's wrong as well. So justice is for everyone and fairness is for everyone. Um, <laughs> that's correct. That's true. Because it, 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 white people are hurt by these false notions of their superiority. I mean, yeah, but, but, it, but, it's, but, it, but it's quite stupid. Actually, because now let's look at slavery. Let's look at the, the idea itself. Now, when you want to make someone a slave, you take a chain, you tie one on his leg, but when you tie the other end for him to remain a slave, it's on your own leg. So it means that free the slave equally means free yourself. It's not just for the slave, but also for yourself because you are also a slave because you are both tied by the same chain. If you are not tied by the chain, then he is free. As long as he's not free, you are equally not free. All right, now, United and also States. And some, also something else to, that people don't think about, how it affected the culture, enslavement of people. You can't have slavery unless you have violence or the threat of violence. So I think that's why the American South has this culture of violence. I mean, you have to make people be enslaved. And of course, one of the things that changed when, you know, in the arguments about slavery, slavery was goes back to ancient time, but in the United States for the first time, well, or, or in the new world slavery, you have racial slavery as opposed to, and so slavery gets tied in with race as opposed to just uh, a nation conquering another country. John Smith of Pocahontas fame, for example, uh, was enslaved, in fact, when he was uh, in Europe, you know, fighting in a war. But when you made slavery a racial thing, it becomes only one group of people. And to show you a great example, the law had been in England that children followed the status of the father. But in the United States, they changed that law so that the children of an enslaved person would become a slave, even if the father was free or a white person. So that then makes slavery hereditary. So there are all kinds of ways that the law is implicated in creating what we have today uh, and, and continuing patterns there. And therefore, the law that we have that is continually, that the people are referring to is in, in some ways actually encourage slavery. Otherwise, they need to free the people. So the question I really have for you is this one. In 2022, do you think the United States have citizens that have equal right also, you need to fight to get this right. You have to fight to get this right, because I think they're trying to be taken away. Uh, the law had really moved in quite a good direction, but the last Supreme Court, uh, through the Burger Court, uh, there was some retreat, but when Rehnquist became the Chief Justice and uh, the courts moved in now under Roberts, uh, has been moving even more so to undermine these rights. I think the rights were there. It didn't mean because it's not just the law, but as you said, it is where people have had to live, the segregated patterns, the schools because of those segregated patterns, uh, not having equal schools that gives equal opportunity. So it's not just the law because you have the effects of the law for all those years, but at least the law was moving a direction toward fairness. Now the court, which I think is out of step with where people are in the United States by far, which is different than before, but they are moving in a direction of more unfairness and more discriminatory practices and saying it's okay. Um, your book, Justice Defer, what is the central message of that book? Well, I think there's a lot there, the importance of law in creating the the rules that we live by and particularly how they were used race as a way to discriminate 
against a group of people. But there's also hope there, and that is that often, like the great dissenter, Justice Harlan. Justice Harlan was a slave owner who fought for the Confederates, and he becomes the greatest champion of Black people. And the reason is, a lot of people haven't really understood this. He was a devout Presbyterian. And when he, when he dissents in Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, which laid out segregation, he says, you know, I, I'm racist too, but the law says this, and we have to obey the law. And it's a great way to also understand what is going on in the courts is look at those dissents. We used to sort of excuse people and say, well, they didn't know at that time about this, but look at the dissents all the way from the 1830s and they are pointing out those dissenters, there were alternatives. There were people there who knew and argued the right things. So I think that's important. And one of the things about the law that, had, that we really emphasize in the book is you can read the law two ways, the broadest it can be or the narrowest it can be. And what has happened recently is that while you read the First Amendment, these people who claim to be originalists and textures, the First and Second Amendment, they read as broadly as they can. Gun rights, you have the right to, to have a gun, that's what, but they have not read the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, which are also part of the Constitution. If they read them in the same way, then they're going to have to incorporate and make the laws apply to everyone equally and to work toward justice and to get rid of those badges of slavery. So there's a lot of lessons there. And the one thing we learned is that was rather sad for me is just how the short period of time that I grew up with, with what we call the Warren Court, was a great period of trying to do the right thing but it was a short period, if you look from the beginning to the end, where we're going now. Uh, and I think, though, there have always been people willing to fight for the right. And I honestly believe that with the good educations that we've had now, people know better. So they have to get out and vote. And how important voting is. I think people don't understand just how critical that is to our democracy. And you just have to vote if you're gonna to try to change things and make them better and more fair. All right, in page eight of your book, The Age of Lincoln, you wrote, and I quote, let me look at it properly. Individuals spoke out in pursuit of freedom for all, but they were simply ignored and marginalized. Can you say something to that effect, explain it even better? That, that particularly African-Americans always spoke out for freedom, is that what I was saying there? Uh, but they were marginalized? And I think that's true. There were always, I mean, from, from the very beginning, African-Americans fought for their rights and for their freedoms, but there were ways more. There were also always whites who spoke up for freedom and things until, in fact, you had the Civil War. And as I said, you had this exciting period of Reconstruction where, you know, I, if, in fact, they, if, you know, I believe if Lincoln had lived, the one thing he would not have allowed is the rule of law to have been broken by terrorists. And so that would have made a huge difference if you think about it over time in terms of where we would be today. You had this interracial democracy. You had congressmen, you had, you had uh, black senators during reconstruction. And you have to have people at the table making those decisions. A lot of times I've learned in over my years of testifying in courts, um, the quote city for the people on the town council or the county council or the school board are just unaware. They don't realize that there are no sidewalks in the black neighborhood or sewers there. And the reason is, is because they live within five or six houses of one another in the segregated South, in the, the areas that they live in, whereas African American would live in a different session. What a difference it made when with the Voting Rights Act, African-Americans were at the table, could get elected to the town council, the city council and the school board and have their voice heard so that people at least knew what African-Americans wanted in the South at that time. And the same thing goes for other minorities as well. All right, now, I believe that the African-American, what they are asking for uh, really 
it's not that a, a glass house should be built for them. I think it was a, it is a simple thing. They are asking then, they are still asking now, is to be treated just like every other person. And I think this is even a common sense. Why is it difficult for other people to understand this? Well, I think you're exactly right. That's what the 14th Amendment was about, the 13th Amendment and the 15th Amendment. But remember what I said, what had the law and schools taught all those years for 13 generations before it began to tell the truth and move the other way? So it's a, a lot of people believe the nonsense that they were taught. And it was just, it was just created almost history as a propaganda as opposed to the truth. Uh, and this is one of the things, African-Americans have, it seems to me, been the most loyal citizens in the United States. They're the ones who fought our wars so much, and they're the most patriotic over time. And yet white people have not, it seems many white people have not understood this. Uh, look, at, look at culture of the United States, how much of our culture has been shaped by African-Americans or the interaction of black and white. Um, it really shouldn't matter whether you're black or white, but we haven't reached that stage yet. But that would be our hope. I mean, that's what King was saying um, in his I Have a Dream speech, which is interesting because the speech we know as I Have a Dream speech, Dr. King called it the Emancipation Proclamation speech. It was the anniversary of the Emancipation Prize, and he was speaking there, calling for the same rights that they were moving for and that were overthrown that African Americans got during Reconstruction, the importance of the vote again. Uh, now, <clears throat> you are a human being, I am a human being. Uh, you know what is good for you, I know what is good for me. Now, in the United States, if the law Say, beginning from today, treat everybody equally without necessarily where you are coming from. You are good for the job, you do it. Nobody cares whether your skin is black or white or green or yellow. What will it take away from the white Americans? Nothing. In fact, it never has. What is happening is there are people, and I have to be very careful because I try to live as a person of faith and forgive my enemies and see the image of God in everyone, but there are people who are using prejudice to manipulate other people so that they can stay in power or get in power politically. Uh, it is better for everyone, as I, I've tried to show in the books I've written, to treat all people equally and fairly, but there are just people who, as I said, don't understand how affirmative action was there for white people and it excluded African-Americans or other minorities, and deliberately so, that the state sponsored discriminatory policies all those years. And so now we have to work to undo that and find ways to do it. And I do believe that young people believe exactly what you said, the great majority of them. They're my hope to see the great majority. Let me see, I will, let me read the last paragraph. Uh, last paragraph of my book, I had forgot about this, but this actually sort of answers your question, I think, because it is sort of depressing to look at the history of race and then see how we're moving backwards again. But this is the last paragraph of Justice Deferred. In a 1951 poem, the Harlem Renaissance bard Langston Hughes asked, what happens to a dream deferred? History shaped by the court's unfolding interpretations and limitations on rights, tells us that justice has been deferred too long. Abraham Lincoln challenged us, determine that the thing can and shall be done, and then we shall find the way. We take inspiration from the young people who will be writing the next chapter. In 2019, 2020, the U.S. Youth Poet Laureate Amanda Gorman gave readings around the country of a poem she had been commissioned to write for Independence Day. In her performance at the Academy, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Gorman, an African-American woman from Los Angeles who was a student at Harvard, explained that she sees American democracy not as, quote, something that's broken, but as something that's unfinished. 
Rather than falling prey to discouragement, she speaks of being audacious in taking up the mantle of our founders and playing her role in finishing their work. In her poem, Believer's Hymn for the Republic, she declares, every day we write the future together. And I really love that. This was before Amanda Gorman had become famous, incidentally, with the Biden inauguration. So we thought we had discovered her. But uh, I think that that says powerful what what needs to be done. You know, if you get too discouraged, then I fear the worst. I think now's the time we have to claim that mantle, as she says, and fight for justice and right, and particularly for voting rights. I'll give one other example about what happens. It's, it's one of the stories that is very powerful. I almost cry when I tell it. You know, Thurgood Marshall had said that he didn't ever plan to retire from the Supreme Court. After he was dead, he wanted to prop him up there. And then he said, well, he expected, another time he said he expected to be shot in bed with another man's wife when he was 110 years of age. But he retired at a different time. And, and I, I'll tell this story. In fact, if he had not retired, he was not in good health. It looked like George Bush was like at 80% rating no one saw the recession coming. No one saw Ross Perot. If he had not retired, it would have been Bill Clinton who appointed his replacement. So that would not have been Clarence Thomas. And that person would have probably ruled, in fact, in the 2000 election of Gore and Bush for Gore, as opposed to Supreme Court ruling 5-4 in favor of the second George Bush. And just think about all those judges appointed and where we'd be now if that had happened. But in 1980, when Carter lost to Ronald Reagan and the Reagan revolution, um, Justice Brennan, who was Thurgood Marshall's best friend, uh, was very upset because the chair of the Judiciary Committee had been Ted Kennedy, who was very much, very much supportive of minority rights and particularly voting rights. And um, Strom Thurmond had been on the Judiciary Committee. And when Thurgood Marshall came up for both his uh, Supreme Court appointment and his earlier appointment as a judge, Thurmond just really attacked Thurgood Marshall, claiming, you know, oh, you work for a communist organization, all kinds of things. There was no love lost between them. So when Brennan heard that Reagan had won and that the new chair of the Judiciary Committee was going to be Strom Thurmond, he comes up. Now, Brennan is a very small man in physical stature, but great in intellect and heart. Thurgood Marshall was a giant of a man physically and also intellectually and of heart. And when he says, is it true, is it true that Strom Thurmond is going to be chair of the Judiciary Committee? Thurgood Marshall puts his arm around Brennan and this huge man with this little, little fellow in their robes walk off into their chambers to continue their struggle for social justice. It's such a symbolic story for me of how they continued to fight and what a difference they had made, but it also shows what a difference it makes who you elect president of the United States, because that's where the courts changed and begin to change. That is a lifetime appointment. And just because you don't like that someone wears pantsuits, I think people need to learn that you have basically two parties in the United States. And if you throw your vote away because you don't support a party who will give you fairer judges, then you get the kind of courts we've had since 1980. That's true. <laughs> That's true. All right. Now. All these years, until uh, we, we, we thought of um, state uh, sponsoring uh, discriminatory uh, policies, which of course produce what we eventually had, no? Because it's not it's not accident. Uh, what did what is taught in school is not accident; it's planned. But if we are not looking for a most just society where everybody is treated equally, irrespective of where you are coming from, are we even sure that? That's a poisonous idea of racial superiority and inferiority is not to be taught today 
2022 in the United States? You know, and you know, I think we've come a long way. Historians, when I went to graduate school at Princeton in 1969, they knew that Reconstruction had been this positive, exciting time. But school, it takes a long time. School teachers, and believe me, I really think that public school teachers doing God's work, they're so good. They have been doing a much better job, and that's why I think that young people know better than things. And this worries me now that there are these laws coming that people are passing in states to keep people from talking about race that might hurt somebody's feelings. You know, I, I would... I would want my children to be taught to spell a word right, even if it hurts their feeling, be told that they're spelling it wrong. Or that, you know, that four plus four equals eight. If they say seven and somebody doesn't correct them, then what, what are you doing? But these new laws are very scary that are coming in trying to stop teachers from teaching about the truth in race relations. Uh, there were court cases way back um, allowing the teaching of this that that rule that the truth matters if it's history you need to understand it and lincoln understood you really can't have a democracy without an educated citizenry i don't mean that you have to go to school to be educated either but you need to be able to think critically i think and make up your own mind from evidence and you know in this last since 2016 we have people talk about alternative facts as if evidence doesn't matter, but it does. There are facts. Let me see if I can get this quote. And that's what we have to do. Just let the evidence speak for itself. If from all your book, you were to recommend one uh, for readers who want to understand uh, the question of race relationship or all the argument that you have been treated relating to, to the United States, which of your book will you recommend and why? I think the last book, which can be depressing, but also I hope gives a true story of race from the beginning of America right into 2021 is justice deferred race in the Supreme Court. Uh, I do think it's easy to read. It's about people, not about the cases and how people can and did make a difference, which should give us hope and inspiration if people want to read about the, the Civil War in Lincoln, of course, it would be the age of Lincoln. But I really think if you're concerned about race, and some of the ideas are in the age of Lincoln, but this is an overview. It's never been done before. And I think there's a reason that no one ever wrote this book. I don't think any historian could have written Justice Deferred. And I don't think any legal scholar or lawyer could have, but this is the combining of a civil rights attorney, legal scholar, and a historian into a narrative of one voice telling this story that combines these two disciplines in a way that people can understand and read it, I think. Justice deferred. Okay, now, who justice is actually deferred here? And if there is a solution at the end of your book, what, did you, what, what is that kind of solution? It is to care to pay attention, to tell the truth, and to stand up, and particularly to vote. And the 13th Amendment, the 13th Amendment is still there, that we have to and have the right to end those badges of slavery that have hung over all these generations since legal slavery ended. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, America is a stronger for a fair state where everybody can be treated equally on the basis of merit not on uh, who is your father, where you are coming from, on you, are, you deserve it because you are a human being. Uh, so if that is the situation, if that is the, the war that must be won, what is the obstacle that must be crossed? What are the major problems that are standing between this fair state and today? I think fear. I think fear by some white people that's being manipulated by certain politicians for their advantage, trying to find other people to blame, whether it's immigrants who they see coming as all people were immigrants to America, except for the Native Americans, uh, the indigenous people, 
Uh, I think there is great fear that's being manipulated and manipulated brilliantly uh, by politicians. In fact, way back in 2016, I said that it looked like to me that Donald Trump was Pitchfork Ben Tillman, the first racial demagogue who got dressed up, dyed his hair oranges, and put a tie on that was too long and went to New York City, taking the same techniques that racial demagogues from the former Confederacy had used to disfranchise and segregate and put in those years of the Jim Crow laws in the South. Uh, and you could not underestimate how people can be manipulated that way because when they feel aggrieved, when they feel that particularly in economic bad times, uh, they look for someone to blame. And in this case, and not just Donald Trump, but a lot of other politicians have used race and uh, immigration and code words that refer back to race that became rather popular back with first Goldwater and then Reagan and then Nixon uh, as president, which formed a political party, at least in the South, really became the Republican Party, became a party that tried to identify the Democratic Party as a party of black people. Therefore, the Republican Party would be the party of white people and really took, really took the, really took the party of Lincoln, that great party for fighting for civil rights and rights for all, and has made it a party that fights against the rights for all. Um, it, it's, it's really, to me, as a historian, it's just tragic. <laughs> All right, now looking at the, the, the history of, um, of civil rights uh, movement in the United States, uh, and the people who have fought for equal right, for justice, for a fair state, I want to refer, I want to, refer to that again. Who is your hero? I mean, who is your best reference in this, in this case? Well, you can go all the way back from, I mean, from the beginning to someone like Thaddeus Stephen or Frederick Douglass or John Adams, uh, the, the John Quincy Adams, who, who defended the Amistad. But, you know, one of my favorite, I think, of all times, well, there's several, but Thurgood Marshall on the legal side, Martin Luther King, Bob, Mo there's so many. I mean, that's what the civil rights movement was. There's a story that my friend Grady Butler, Reverend Grady Butler in Greenville, South Carolina, was in jail with Dr. King the night that uh, uh, Robert Kennedy uh, called uh, his widow. And King gathered, there were like 13 people in this cell. He said, boys, it was late at night. Some of them said, come here, I got something to tell you. This, this uh, brother of a senator called my wife, and this man might become president. This movement might become significant. And what that tells you is, you know, there were movements all over the place, but it wasn't a center. And so there were these, so many like King throughout. And that's one of the stories in Justice Deferred, showing what people did, just people who were determined to struggle to have a better world for their children, like Reverend Delane, who's in the book, is really the case that became Brown v. Board out of Clarendon, South Carolina. Just poor people trying to get a fair education. In fact, it started out, all they wanted was gas for a bus. And whites who controlled the school board just wouldn't do it. Even though they had school buses for white children, African Americans, some had to walk 13 and 14 miles, the bus going right by them. So the African American community got their own bus and they just asked for gas for it. And they refused to do it. And then that becomes the case. It becomes Brown v. Board that Thurgood Marshall argued that ended supposedly segregation in America. Of course, what we know is we've never had integration. You know, we never got integration. We got the end of segregation, supposedly, but as you pointed out, people lived in segregated neighborhoods. I found in one court case I was doing, uh, the governor of South Carolina, James Burns, who had been on the Supreme Court at one time and had been Secretary of State, uh, uh, incredible, called the Cardinal Richelieu of the Senate. And he said, if we 
do lose the case, we can always use residential segregation as a way to keep the schools segregated. So even that was a deliberate pattern. So now we have school districts where people have a good tax base and wonderful schools. And then we have school districts where poor people live and they don't have those resources. They're under resource areas in schools. And that is a direct legacy of state deliberate action of discriminatory practices against minorities. This question, I, I think is uh, important uh, for me. I, I don't know how you look at it, but anyway, this is it for you. What do you think is the real reason behind the discrimination in the United States logically taking? I think a lot of it's just ignorance that people have been taught discrimination that people have for years been taught, uh, as I said, the law itself for 12 of the generations enshrined white privilege and made people think that way, or at least behave that way. If they didn't make them think that way, made them behave that way. Uh, and so a lot of people have not moved beyond that, but what has happened is that a political party has picked up on this particularly Timeless time of the United States moving toward a majority minority population. And so to stay in political power, one political party is working hard to find ways to discriminate and to blame a group of people and to keep them from having a voice in government through disfranchisement and diluting the power and influence of their votes. But I think, right. it's, I think it's manipulation. All right. I like that. I can live without there being a heaven, but I'll tell you, when people do that sort of thing, it would be hard for me to accept that they don't go to hell for what they've done to this country and to other people. Thank you so much for your reflection. All right. Now, uh, how can people find your book? How can people connect with you even more? Please use this uh, few seconds to promote yourself. Yeah. Well, there is a... Uh, uh, the, there's a website for the book. You can go and find it there. It's on Amazon. It's published by Harvard. Uh, and I will give you the website, which has it's a lot of stuff on. There's also a website for the age of Lincoln. I had originally put the entire book on the uh, age of Lincoln up, but my press said that I couldn't do that. So I put up as much as I could because I wanted people to read it uh, more than anything else. But let me, here it is. Uh, find the website. Um, boy, oh boy, uh, it's I think. Oh, here it is HTTP justice and then hyphen deferred period Clemson period edu. So it's justice hyphen deferred period Clemson period edu. And there's a website there that has a lot more on it, there's a lot more than in the book that had to be left out. Uh, we've actually put the court cases there, the evidence, so you can see it for yourself. Uh, we put opposing ideas. Uh, we really want it to be where you can go to learn about how the law has worked and how it can work. What would you recommend? What do you think are the solution to have a fair state in the United States? I mean, okay, to have a fairer United States, what do you think need to be done? Critical recommendation. Please go. Well, I think that the courts have to rule for fairness. I really believe that it's a matter of time. Despite all the things that are going on, you're not going to stop this demographic change. And I'll give you an example. Uh, in, in Georgia that we talked about earlier, uh, there was a court case by plaintiffs uh, because they could, the minority plaintiffs, they'd never been elected in Gwinnett County. And I think they would have won, but they didn't have to because the county changed to a majority minority and they won all the they won all the places i think it's going to happen in america too that you cannot stop this demographic at least i don't think you can this demographic change where we are going to be a much more multicultural and what have been considered minorities are going to be a majority in many states and certainly a significant minority that will have impact in voting unless they are denied that ability to vote. And that's why it's so important to vote now so that doesn't happen. And I really think Congress has to step up. 
you know, we have the John Lewis Act and all that, that people don't, can you imagine people saying, let's not support people having the right to vote? I mean, it's hard to believe that we're so bipartisan that democracy can only work if people have the right to vote, the equal right to vote. And there are people who are not willing to support a bill that just guarantees the fundamental rights they're in the Constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Uh, as a last statement, what would it be from you? Well, I, I believe sincerely that though things may look bad, that most Americans of whatever ethnicity or ever are good people, and they want to do the right thing. But we have at least groups of people have manipulated them in ways that they themselves don't understand the truth. That on an individual level, they want to treat people equally, but they don't understand how these laws work to discriminate against other people. So I believe if we can lay the evidence out, as I've tried to do in this book, Justice Deferred with my co-author, Armin Durfner, that if people understand, then they will take their citizenship rights more seriously. People fought so hard to get the vote for people, that they need to go out and vote and vote their consciences. I would never tell anyone how to vote, but please consider when you vote what it means in terms of the implications of the policies that are going to be set out by judges and lawmakers over the years. And we have to have these three, you know, the founding fathers were pretty good in the sense that they had three branches of government, and they each need to stand up as they did with the Voting Rights Act, as they did with the 14th and 15th Amendment. Congress, when Supreme Court had said otherwise, then Congress passed a new law that said, no, this is the law now, that in fact, as the Declaration of Independence said, all men or people are created equal under the 14th Amendment and the 13th Amendment, and they all have the right to vote in the 15th Amendment. So I think we need to move past this bipartisan, this terrible partisanship that we really, I don't even think it was this bad in the Civil War that led to a Civil War, because uh, we've got to start working together to preserve democracy. You know, the world itself is struggling between authoritarianism uh, right now and democracy and that is playing out in the United States is very frightening to me. And we have to fight against that with all sort of resources we have. And the main one I think is the truth that there really is evidence. You know, it was uh, uh, another Adams who said that Americans are the most ignorant people of their history than anybody else. This was uh, Henry Adams in his autobiography. They just don't know their history. They know the stories that have been made up. But if we can get that evidence there, I think people will want to do what is right. All right, Vernon Bolton, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. I've learned a lot from your conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate you doing this very much and wish you the very best and have a really blessed day. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate our review Obehe podcast and share with your friends who might need it. I remain Obehe Ewafo. Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you in the next episode.